<laughs> See? Even my smartwatch knows that I'm very fucking stressed. Hi, hello, how's it going? It's low. Don't get me wrong, this is not an official comeback. I am still on hiatus. I still haven't finished my thesis. I know I shouldn't be here. I know I am aware. If my advisor sees me, um, this video and knows that I am recording a video instead of being revising, you haven't seen anything, please look the other way. I suppose my advisor finds out that I have a YouTube channel, um, my problems will be a little bigger than him finding out that I'm not revising when I should be, so... Anyways, as you all know, this is not a secret to anybody. I have a huge ass thesis to finish. I am on the finish line. I just need to revise the shit out of that. However, once again, the caucasity of humanity has drawn me out of my path and um, tempted me into sitting in front of a camera and making another rent video um, because uh, things happened on TikTok and on Twitter that I just, I just have to address, okay? I just have to talk about them. No one asked me, but I'm gonna say it regardless. You might be aware of the controversy uh, involving TikToker and entrepreneur and generally a person who gives off really sketchy off vibes uh, named John John, who owns a company called Jones Bones. Terrible name, by the way, terrible company name. Also a terrible nickname for a, a grown ass man. So I won't be calling him John John in this video, okay? It's John, we're adults, we can handle it. Basically, if you're not aware of who John is, he is a, he made a TikTok and he has a TikTok account. Basically showcasing and saying that he is an osteologist allegedly and that um, because it is not illegal to own and sell human remains. He has um, a business that sells human bones and also he collects an insane amount of bones in his house. Hello, my name is John John. And this is my cat, Chonk. I study osteology, primarily specializing in the medical bone trade. And this is how and why I work with osteology for a living. My pride and joy is my human spine collection. And in the US, there's no federal regulation against the ownership, sale, or possession of human osteology, so it's completely legal. Legit, his apartment looks like the NYC version of the fucking Paris Catacombs, or um, that really creepy church in the Czech Republic that has a, a chandelier made of ribs. There's also that really weird church, I think in Portugal, it's called uh, Capella dos Ossos, I think, in Evora, um, that also has a ton of bone. Anyway, listen, this boy's aesthetic is giving medieval craze catholic aesthetics so uh suppose that person's school of design diploma really really came to fruition huh obviously this has of course sparked a lot of controversy um especially after people went into his website which is very expertly designed on his website he claims to do responsibly source human osteology he talks a little bit about you know his goal with his business which is to demystify osteology and he sells different um, specimens including medical rarities which is how he classifies the bones of unborn infant children at eight months old yeah this particular situation has sparked my interest because it has to do a little with what i'm studying in terms of my thesis and i'm going to explain a little bit further on this video but also because he was very adamant that um it was legal for him to own those bones. And because it was legal, that somehow would solve all the ethical issues that went around the fact that he owned human bones and sold them for a living. Though he claims to be an osteologist, he's actually a designer with a degree from Parsons School of Design in New York City. And so um, a lot of people have uh, righteously actually raised concerns about the fact if he's even qualified to be handling those remains. Being a human rights attorney, I am more than aware that legality and morality only overlap in a good day, if that much. And so I wanted to investigate this a little more. And the more that I investigated, the more that this became something that I knew that would just go beyond my thesis and was something that would actually have to be addressed um, and discussed because I have a lot of points to be made and Twitter is terrible for ranting. Y'all just gonna have to deal with this today. It really wasn't until I reached a particular blog post on his website that it really solidified to me that this is a question that must be discussed. So he has this um, part on his website, it's called The Place of Private Collections. 
I'm not gonna read all of this. It's a bunch of blah, 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 but basically he argues that universities and museums can't handle all of the existing material, all of the existing bones, and that bones are a precious resource for learning and etc. Um, and so private collectors actually help keeping this available pool of bones for studying and that, you know, it's sad that these bones can't be available to the public, but it's important that this is made available um, and kept safe by the people who actually have the resources and the way to keep this in a pristine condition. By doing that, he argues that they will help those pieces to survive, which, you know, I would agree if we were talking about books, 100%, but we're talking about human bones. And so the situation uh, changed quite dramatically when we're talking about this. Not only his affirmation that private collectors are necessary and a necessary part of the business because um, they keep safe the things that museums and, and uh, hospitals and medical schools can't keep safe, which is not true. Um, he... How do I put this without being um, extremely rude? Um, he has the argumentative capacity of a high school freshman who went to mock trial for the first time and the only way that he prepared beforehand was by binge watching Jordan Peterson's YouTube videos the night before. So, however, unfortunately for this man, not only I am a human rights attorney, but I'm also a national debate vice champion. So while being stupid might be constitutional, I also know that pointing out stupidity when I see it is also constitutional. So today, since I'm very angry at this, I decided to make this everyone else's problem. And we're going to discuss this issue thoroughly today through this video essay. Because this is a booktube channel and I talk about books, don't worry, I'm gonna keep into the book theme. We're gonna discuss a little books today, but mainly I just want to talk about this thing that has made me really angry and I have points to be made. So, y'all ready? Let's get started. I'm going to divide this video essay into five sections. So the first one is going to be the legality of bone ownership. Then we're going to discuss the his approach to the business of selling bones. Then on a third point, we are going to discuss whose bones are available for purchase and in what conditions those bones came to be available for purchase. The fourth point is the ethics of the bone trade and how the medical bone collection came to be. And five, some final considerations and some final conclusions that we can get from this case. The first question that this situation poses to us is, is it legal to own human bones? In his TikTok and YouTube videos, John makes it really clear that there is no federal legislation that rules the uh, private ownership of human remains. And he says it all the time that it is not illegal, it's actually legal to own bones. This is why he owns as many bones as he does, and this is why he uh, does this for a living. Now the question is, is it really legal to own privately uh, human remains? It's definitely not as clear-cut as it makes it seem though. I am going to center this analysis on US law. Um, I'm sure other countries have different uh, dispositions in regarding to this. Um, for instance, in the United States, you can sell your body to science and you can sell um, your body to a company that will then sell those body parts to universities and science projects and scientific research. In Brazil, you cannot do this. You are forbidden from selling your corpse. So if you want to donate your body to science, you have to donate your body for free. Those differences exist in different countries, but since he is located in the United States and since he sells in the United States, I feel like it's only fair that we analyze this through the United States perspective. Generally speaking, uh, Jones Bones is not wrong. There is no federal legislation, no comprehensive federal legislation that forbids the private ownership of human bones or cremated remains. I specifically say human bones or cremated remains because as far as I could tell and I could research, uh, you can't privately own a corpse. So while you can sell your corpse to medical companies and medical students, medical um, universities and all of that, you can't sell your body privately to someone. Reuters actually did an amazing report on how the body part industry and the medical specimen industry in the United States actually um, 
goes after the poor and the vulnerable in order to be able to achieve the body parts. And so it's a very interesting debate. We're going to go a little into it later in this video, but if you're interested, I'm going to link the entire reporting in the description below. So while it's not illegal, there are some restrictions to this. If you want a more in-depth law on the legislation, I strongly c recommend a book called The Law of Human Remains by Tanya Marsh. She goes really in depth about the different types of human remains and what can be done and what cannot be done. Specifically on the restrictions that are posed on the possession of human remains in the United States, the only extreme restriction that exists is that you cannot own or sell any sort of Native American remains or funeral regalia. This has been in place since 1990 with the... Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Acts. That's a long one. Basically, this act forbids the ownership and the trade of any Native American remains, body parts, funeral regalia, or any traditional objects. This, however, creates two main problems. The first one is that after a while, you cannot kind of tell the ethnicity of a person off a glance. And so it would require some very specific testing in order to make sure that the bones that you're selling are not Native American which means that if meticulous care is not taken into uh, noting down and keeping all of the bones that you have in your possession, it's very possible that some of the is this information will be lost and you might get into the business of buying a bone or buying bone parts um, that will be Native American and you would not know and you would be incurring in a crime because they didn't have the proper record and the, the person selling you these bones did not keep the proper records in order to prove to you that those were non-Native American bones. Um, while selling non-Native American bones is somewhat um, allowed, there's always the possibility that you are unknowingly buying Native American bones, which is a problem in and out of itself. That you know, if we assume that buying bones at all is ethical, but we're gonna get there. The second problem however, that this brings is that Native American and Indigenous are not synonyms. So what this means is that while um, buying Native American bones and Native American funeral regalia might be illegal within the context of the United States, this doesn't mean that all Indigenous populations have the same protection under the law. So while all Native American people are Indigenous, not all Indigenous people are Native Americans. And this legal loophole is what allowed Jones Bones to actually sell a Sami skull. Now the Sami are Indigenous populations in the northern part of Scandinavia that have been fucked over by the Scandinavian governments for time and time again, but they are recognized Indigenous populations. And so they were cashing on the hype of selling an Indigenous artifact or in case an indigenous skull in order to drive up the price for this specific specimen because since this is indigenous and not native american this technically is allowed to be sold the entire specimen has been taken down but if you google jones bones sami skull you can still find the ad so it's it's the traces are there so this exception aside the native american human remains um it's generally possible for you to own and trade bones. That is technically not uh, forbidden and John's bones is correct in that regard. What he doesn't say, however, is that in the United States it is illegal for you to skeletonize a corpse. Skeletonization of a corpse is when you take all of the flesh off a body and it leaves only the bones for the bones to be used as specimens in teaching and whatever. Caitlin Doty explains this question really well in a book called um, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? Big questions from tiny mortals about death. Um, the title might be funny, but this was one of my favorite 2020 reads. Absolute delight to listen on audiobook, so I highly recommend that one. But in that book, she actually discusses if, like, I can, can I keep my parents' skulls after they die? And what she explains to us is that when a body dies in the United States, you have three options. You either bury the body, you either cremate the body, or you donate that body to science. Anything else that you do with the body that doesn't fall into those three categories, and this might vary from state to state, but generally this is how it happens, 
Anything that you do with a body that falls outside of those three categories is going to be at least a misdemeanor. There is a lot of legislation in place that is called abuse of corpse. So depending on what you do with the corpse that you didn't bury or cremate or donate to science, um, that can also be considered abuse of corpse. And so there is a, a heavier uh, sentencing and a heavier uh, penalty and fee involved with that. So. In the United States, if a person dies, they cannot be turned into a skeleton. And the problem that this poses is that the majority of the collection that belongs to John's Bones and that is sold by John's Bones um, doesn't come from the United States. This is extremely problematic. But before we discuss this, I have a bone to pick. Ha! Huh. With John's Bones' business model. I'll see myself out. So the second thing that I want to discuss is John's Bones' business model or the business branding that he developed. On his website, when you walk into his website, he introduces the company by saying the following. The ability to study skeletal remains is often thought to be reserved for those in labs or historical professions. Not everyone has the same access to museums, medical collections, and artifacts that explain and cultivate the science behind human bones. We fight to create an environment that not only prioritizes education, but informs customers and defeats social stigmas. And then um, he argues in another part where he talks about their history uh, in, a, <laughs> in a topic called an industry-wide facelift. Sir, this is not botched. In this topic, he argues... When John first entered the field, he noticed that the commercial bone industry was strongly associated with the concept of death. Gee, I wonder why. Was often considered a taboo and was usually portrayed in a dark gothic aesthetic. Rather than feeding into all the stigmas and tropes, John has worked hard to dust away the cobwebs and give these pieces a second life is his, in his own unique way. Okay, but then there's this blog post that he talks about his branding. And I think that this is important to understand what he means and the consequences of his business choices um, for the business that he's trying to put forward. So in this blog post, he says, because of people's perceptions of bones in modern pop culture as something macabre and scary, I sought to destigmatize this industry through imagery. Skulls and bones are often associated with things like heavy metal, golf imagery, or pirates. Can you guys hear that? It's a bunch of art historians dying. In order to combat this popular perception, I decided to try to make my company's public image cute and approachable, to bridge the gap between people's fear and this vital under resource for understanding the human body. I have a lot of issues with this. And in order to explain my issues, I want to talk a little bit about this book. This is Smoke It's In Your Eyes and Other Lessons from the Crematorium by Caitlin Doty. I have talked about this book so much, but I feel like this explains extremely well what my problems with John's branding are. In this book, Caitlin Doty traces like a memoir from a childhood that was very death, den very steep in death denial to a future as a funeral director and a funeral home owner. There is a specific part in this book that she talks about how her original plan, plan um, when she got into the funeral industry was to create a funeral home that would put the fun back in funeral. This pun was Caitlyn who wrote. I had nothing to do with it. I'm just repeating it. But basically what she thought when she thought of creating this funeral home was that people were afraid of death or so she thought that people were afraid of death and funerals and they felt bad in, in funerals and you know situations that celebrate death because um, they focus too much on the fact that that person is long, no longer there and too little on the life that came before the dying. And so she thought that if she could make a funeral home that would be highly individualized and that would take away our focus from the death and the pain and the grief and the separation but put us back into a celebration mode, then we would all accept death. She criticized herself very harshly in this part because she feels like if she could make death be acceptable, clean, um, and uncomplicated, then she wouldn't be so thoroughly um, paralyzed in fear by the fact that she too would die one day. And she says that she had this perception, and the reason why she believed on this so staunchly was because nowadays the problem is not that we're just too close to death, and that death is just too present of a thing in our lives. It's precisely the opposite. 
it used to be that people who die at homes and their corpses would be prepared by the family. And so people used to have a very unmediated relationship with death. Death happened in our rooms, in, in our homes. And, you know, we bathed the dead in their own beds. We dressed the dead. It was a whole thing. In modern times, we are... We experience that death through a medium. There, there's always a mediated experience. The people that we love usually die away from us in hospitals, hospices, or um, retirement homes. Usually whenever we get to see the dead person at their funeral, they have been embalmed and prepared and perfectly set in the casket to give the impression that they are peaceful. And so our interactions with death are very mediated by this industry that wants to take the gruesome reality of death away from us. And so whenever we are faced with something that is clearly a signifier of death, such as a human skeleton, we are deeply reminded of the fact that, you know, we are mortal and that no matter how cute we're trying to make the situation to be and how special and whatnot, that is still what we will become. And so we become dependent on those mediated forms of experiencing death. And what Caitlin Doty argues is that the way that we can solve this death anxiety is by being death positive, is by looking death in the eyes and being like, I, I am going to be like you one day and this terrifies the shit out of me, but this is a reality that I'm, that I'm willing to face. The way to bridge this gap is to not the make the human remains or death cool, is to simply to look at them and accept them as the reality that they are. And so what John is making is not making bones seem cool or osteology seem cool. He's actually detaching the bones that he's selling and that he's collecting from the fact that made those bones be what they are, which is death. What he's trying to hide, and I don't know if this is out of anxiety or this is deliberate, but he's trying to hide the fact that a person had to die for those bones come to come to their hand. And so when you separate those bones from the death of their owner, when you sell a skull and you divorce the skull from the reality of the death that made that skull comes to be, when you hold that specimen, you see an object. You don't see a skull that had a brain, that had imagination, that had dreams, that had fears, that had hopes. You don't see a skull that you know, had lips that kissed people they loved and tongues that taste food that they loved and, um, and, and eyes that shed tears and, you know, a face that smiled. If you don't understand that that skeleton came to be because of someone's death, then you lose sight of the fact that those bones one day felt pain and they felt sorrow and they felt joy and they had hopes and dreams and they are no longer and they died. And so when you divorce the bones that you're selling from the reality of the death, you're trying to push death, death away. And this is bad enough when we're talking about a funeral industry, and this is what Caitlin Doty says in her book, like she recognizes that it was a bad decision to um, make a funeral home where death wouldn't be the center fund. As much so that she's, you know, the death positive person who goes for funeral, green funerals and home funerals now. But when you're talking about selling bones, the, it's so insidious that you're trying to push death away because then that bone doesn't become something that has a lot of ethical questions surrounding it, but rather an object that can or cannot be sold. By pushing death away from the bones, the bones are nothing more than Pokemon cards. And this is what John wants you to think. He wants you to think that there's nothing underlying those bones and he doesn't want you to think about the fact that those bones signify death. He claims that he is simply doing this because it's so closely associated with death. It's so closely associated with sadness and gothic and pirates or whatever the fuck that he says. But the truth is, if we were to think about where those bones came from, we would come to the reality that his business is not sustainable because it depends on the mercantilization and the commodification of actual people. So it's not that the business is sad or bad or taboo or whatever, it's just that good osteologists are deeply aware 
of the fact that the things that they are studying come from someone's death. And because they come from someone's death, by the very nature of osteology, then that must be treated carefully and with respect. When you're holding a human bone in your hands, you're not just holding a piece of calcium. You're holding humanity in your hands. You're holding a piece of flesh that one day felt pain, felt sorrow, felt pleasure, felt joy. It's not something that you can say it's out of stock like it is on his website. It's not something that you can say, oh, it's it's just, uh, uh, we don't have, you know, phalanges anymore. We ran out of phalanges. Like, it's not that. It's just like, there is a level of respect that needs to go into dealing with its bodies that is completely lacking in his business model by the very nature of what he's trying to do. He's trying to sanitize something that cannot be sanitized if you can, if you don't want to lose sight of how deeply, you know, how much of a responsibility, but how much of an honor it is to handle those remains. If we are deeply afraid of bones, and if this topic is taboo, it isn't because we are too close to death or because, you know, we instantly associate um, bones with death, like we have been associated for millennia because the oldest form of memento mori is definitely bones. Ergo, all of the churches that I mentioned in the beginning. It's not something of modernity. It's not a modern pulp culture that has made this assumption. Like, we as humans associate the dead body with death because it's dead. So the problem here isn't that bones aren't cool enough. It's just that whenever we are forced to look at death in the eye, we as a modern society get deeply afraid. And so the problem comes a, a lot before what he's trying to fix here. The braver option, I feel, is not to sanitize death or not to pretend that the things that you're selling are not body parts of someone who has lived, loved, and, and you know, felt pain and eventually died. The brave thing is to look death straight in the eye and go, I know that I will become you. And I know you were once what I am. And I am honored by the opportunity of being reminded of how frail and fleeting my earth existence is. Whenever we force distance from death, we're actually forcing a distance for something that could keep our own humanity in check. Which leads me to my third point. Whose bones can we buy? Philosopher Judith Butler, who I absolutely love and everybody knows this, has an incredible book called Frames of War or When is Life Grievable? And in this book, she argues that not all lives are grieved the same. Basically, what she argues is that grief is what happens when we experience the loss of a fellow human. And I'm going to go into a tangent here that is important and it's kind of confusing, but it's going to make sense, I promise. So bear with me here. When we mourn someone, we mourn a person we recognize and we loved as a fellow human. Humans are social creatures and we depend on one another to live. It's not just a matter of, oh, I need to see people. It's like we are fundamentally dependent on one another. We are dependent on thousands upon thousands of nameless people that make sure that, you know, our food reaches our table every single day. Whenever a fellow human being dies, whether I was close to it or not, that messes with me and I grieve that death because that person takes with them the part of me that counted on them, the part of me that depended on them. And so we grieve a lot of people who we trusted and we depended on and we loved a lot, but we also grieve the human lives that we might not know, but we knew that we depended on them for things that we might not necessarily know what for, but we know that there was a part of us that depended on them in some way. There is a level of vulnerability involved in this and if I need someone else to live, that puts me in a position of frailty and vulnerability because anything that happens to that person will impact me directly. So the argument that Judith Butler raises in her book is that not all lives are grievable the same and not all lives are made to be grievable. Some people are considered less than human and therefore um, we can't establish this connection of dependency because we can't see that person as human, which means that their death doesn't impact us. And we don't see that death as something that will eventually affect us, but rather than just a happenstance. These people who are not seen quite as human will not be grieved at all. And most of the times their deaths will be severely exploited either for political or economic gain. This means 
that while some people will be greeted nationwide with half mass flags and, you know, days of mourning and minutes of silence and stuff, some people, however, will be dehumanized to an extent that their deaths cause no impact in the frames of recognition that surround me and that allow me to live. This is a point that a philosopher that I really like called Jojo Agamben brings in a book called uh, The Remnants of Auschwitz. Basically what he argues is that um, the prisoners in Auschwitz were dehumanized to an extent and he talks specifically about um, a specific type of prisoner who, you know, has been through the worst of the worst and has lost this humanity, was had this humanity taken out of him. And so when that prisoner who is at his wit's ends dies, his death is not a death as much as it is a ceasing to exist. In fact, you know, the Nazis actually forbade those corpses to be called corpses. They had to be called dolls. Because those weren't corpses per se, because in order for you to die and your death to have meaning as a human, you must have lived as a human. If that person was existing as something less than human, then their deaths meant nothing. It, it, it wasn't really a death. And so because they were dehumanized to this extent, the Nazis were able to use that corpse as source material for many things. And we all know this. We know that the Nazis would use hair, fat, skin, bones, teeth. Um, all of this would be taken out of the corpse to serve the Nazi industrial factory and in Nazi economic purposes. And so the corpse was not a sign of a life that had ended, but rather a possibility for profit and economic gain. Am I saying that everyone who sells bones is a Nazi? Absolutely not. What I am saying, however, is that we live in a world where certain people are considered grievable and certain people are considered ungrievable to the point where their corpses are not really signs of a life that has gone, but rather possibilities of profit. This, more often than not, is used as a tactic of genocide and ethnic cleansing to make a person to be dehumanized to the point where their, their deaths are not a tragedy, but they are um, possibilities to gain political, economic, and social power. This is what annoys me the most. John knows this. John knows that the majority of the bodies in his collection come from people who are so deeply marginalized that they do not have the right or they cannot afford a proper burial. He knows that the majority of the bodies in his collection come from outside of the United States in conditions that are considered black market and unlawful by many countries, especially in Southeast Asia. Specifically, there's this one specimen in his website that he says came, has marks specific to a region of Calcutta in India, where in the 1990s, there was actually a huge issue with uh, bone trafficking in that region. And not only you know, people were buying corpses of people of lower castes who couldn't afford to bury their loved ones. People were also snatching bones from graves. And so a lot of those bodies were not sourced ethic ethically at all. This practice might be outlawed today, but it's still relatively common. And so he knows that the majority of the bodies in his collection come from the marginalized, come from the ungrievable, come from those who are considered less than human to the point where their deaths and whatever material they leave behind are not seen as a sign of a life that might be mourned, but as a possibility of someone to make a little money. A burial is an incredibly important rite of passage. It demarks the humanity of the person who has gone. Because if we dem demonstrate that that person will be missed, then we cannot deny that this was a human that has died and we're mourning him. This is why funerals are so politically and so socially important. And why this is there is a, such a huge struggle within indigenous communities to reclaim the bodies and the remains of their loved ones and their ancestors. The truth is, the majority of the bones available to sale today um, are provenient of black market operations in Southeast Asia and other impoverished countries. These are bones that are sourced amongst the poorest and the most marginalized and what Franz Fanon would call the wretched of the earth precisely because the dehumanization that they have been subjected to their entire lives made their lives, the end of their lives, be seen not as a death, but as profit. And so the bones that are available, more often than not, belong to the marginalized. And so there's a huge ethical problem that comes behind this that John knows. And he has mentioned this in many of his videos on TikTok, but he has also mentioned this on his website, so he's aware. I will 
play devil's advocate here because John does say that he sources his bones from medical specimens. So he buys from the medical industry bones that might not be used anymore. And so this is what he calls responsible um, bone sourcing. Is this responsible? And how do these bones end up in those collections in the first place? So in order to illustrate how those bodies and those bones came to be in medical collections and then eventually came to be in, bone, in John's collection in store, I want to highlight a specific case. So in order for us to understand the ethics of the medical bone trade, I want to tell you a little story. And this is a story about the Hospital Colonia de Barbacena. I am going to tell you this story, but I want you to be aware that it might be extremely triggering. But I feel like this is important for us to understand the level of cruelty that is involved in the majority of medical specimens still used to this day. In 1903, the city of Barbacena, in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil, uh, was selected to be the site of a new psychiatric hospital that would be called Hospital Colonia de Barbacena. From its foundation to when it sees activities, it never really sees these activities. It really changed the way that it treated patients somewhere around the mid 1980s, but and it's still working to this day. But from its beginning to the 1980s, it worked in a form of sanatorium asylum where patients would go and they had no perspective of ever leaving. From its the beginning of its, its history to the mid 1980s, this was one of the largest hospitals, psychiatric hospitals in Brazil, and the largest psychiatric hospital in um, Minas Gerais. Um, at, at its peak, it housed over 5,000 patients at once. Um, but the only problem with the Hospital Colonia de Barbacena was that it housed 5,000 uh, patients in a hospital structure that was designed to receive 200. The living conditions in this hospital are told in this book. This is Holocaust Brasileiro by Daniela Ahbex. Unfortunately, this book is not translated into English. It's a pity because this is a definite must read. But in this book, she describes the living conditions that were absolutely hideous and atrocious. This is an actual picture taken at the hospital. All of the pictures that they would take at the hospital are absolutely disturbing. And that highlights like the difficulty and the sheer amount of horror that was living in the Hospital Colonia de Barbacena. I am not going to go too in depth about this in here. If you are interested, I am going to link in the description below um, a documentary that was shot at the Hospital Colonia in 1979. It's called In Nome da Razão or In the Name of Reason. Um, I would advise you to, you know, viewer discretion is advised. It's very, very difficult to watch. It's very triggering and very disturbing at parts. Um, but I'm going to leave it there regardless if you're interested in this actual real story of something that happened in Brazil. The reason why I'm telling this story is because over, between its beginning and 1980, over 60,000 people died in the in this psychiatric hospital. And while the majority of them were buried in um, a cemetery on hospital grounds, which, by the way, nowadays is abandoned and every once in a while people rob graves to sell bones in the black market, so, you know. Um, some of the dead, specifically 1,853 between 1961 and 1980, um, were sold to medical schools throughout the country. And so people would go to the, hosp to the hospital, people would live there, and... An important tidbit about the hospital is that the majority of people who were sent there were not mentally ill as much as they were socially undesirable. So political dissidents, um, women who got pregnant out of wedlock, women who were raped, um, people who were out of jobs, and people who actually needed medical care, medical attention, and their parents and their families sent them to the hospital in hopes that they would get some help. Um, and, you know, when they get there, they were tortured, they were beaten, they were starved, and so it was a whole thing. And out of these, um, over 1,800 people were sold as specimens to um, universities, medical universities around Brazil. And they sold so many corpses that the market became oversaturated. And so the price was so low that the price of a corpse was so low that it really wasn't good business. And so what they started doing was dunking the bodies on acid fats on the patio in front of all of the inmates to dissolve the flesh and be able to sell their skeletons. My own university, Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, 
was the largest buyer of human remains from Baba Sena. Between 1954 and 1967, um, the university bought over a thousand bodies and the majority of them came from Baba Sena. And so those bodies were turned into skeletons and they are still in my university to this day. So people who are forcibly committed, starved to death, beaten to death, tortured to death, and then had their bodies sold are still in that university. This is a story that explains a lot why, even when we're talking about medical trade, because in John's view, if he were to buy bones from a university, he would be sourcing bones responsibly because he would be buying them from the medical trade. However, the way that those bones came to be in the possession of my university was not ethical at all. It was part of a systematic system of exclusion that put people who are socially undesirable in a place where they would never walk out. If we're not thinking about the ethics before the moment that those universities get hold of those bodies, we're not thinking about responsible and ethic at all. The majority of bones and human remains and corpses that we have in medical schools or museums, especially over a certain age, were not responsibly sourced at all. And so it is very difficult for you to rely on a medical status of something as, you know, an ethic, as something that is uh, that is responsible, because the majority of those bodies were not available to the medical community through ethical means. And so where is the responsibility? Because it feels to me that in order to sell those bones respectfully, John actually would have to deeply research the history of each individual piece of bone that he sells. The thing is that this is incompatible with his business model because if he wants to push death away from the corpse and the human remains that he's selling, this means that he would actually have to understand that there was an actual human person behind those bones and so eventually everyone would be sad and drab and, you know, would be related to death, which is something that he does not want. If he thoroughly researches the history of each individual specimen that he sells, then those bones stop being quirky and different and cool objects of study and decoration, and they start being parts of human beings who were, you know, formed and created and put together cell by cell inside of someone's womb, and who went through horrid things in their lives in order to be able to live and die and to be turned into profit the way that they were. His business model and his business branding is contrary to responsibility. And the way that he wants to conduct his business is not con compatible with what everyone would consider responsible and ethic bone sourcing. So with all of that out of the way, and I talk a lot, what are some preliminary conclusions that we can draw? from the situation. The first thing is that while not illegal, uh, bone trading isn't as clear cut as Jones Bones wants to make it seem. On the other hand, dissociating bones from the death that caused them puts marginalized people who are constantly at the risk of being dehumanized by their ethnicity, their race, their social status, their geographical location to also be at risk to be used for profit by a rich guy living in the world's tackiest apartment in New York City with a Parsons School of Design degree that he claims works for osteology for some reason. But here's the thing. John is not the first, nor he is the last, to profit out of the marginalized dead. The industry of selling human remains is big on the internet, it's big on social media, and it's simply you can walk into Instagram or any other sort of website that sells um, that people can sell things and you will find human remains to be sold and to be bought. And to be quite honest, this was also a problem before um, the internet was even a thing. May I remind you that for a long time one of the most sought after types of pigment um, for painting was called mummy brown, which was made out of the ground up material of mummies that the Victorians used to unravel at parties and bought out of Egypt. So the disrespect with the bodies and the dead of the non-Western and the marginalized is nothing new. And John is simply a new iteration of it. It's simply a new facet of something that is inherent to our society. We don't see certain people as human. And we don't see certain people, certain deaths as tragedies. 
This is why it's so important for us to reclaim that death, to look at the death of a marginalized person and see the utter tragedy that it is, not as a possibility of profit. There is no responsibility in profiting out of a marginalized person's pain. This, however, doesn't mean that I think osteology and um, bone collection should be outlawed. Osteology serves a very important purpose in when it comes to learning and educating future doctors. Unfortunately, I will have to handle to him. Um, John makes this argument himself in a blog post that he titled, uh, Why should we be using genuine bones? That he says that while plastic might be useful, there are certain situations where you actually have to go for the real thing, the real bone. Specifically in this blog post, he argues, a good quality non-Halloween prop research grade skull can easily cost double what a genuine human skull would cost. Why pay double for something that is not the real thing? Some of us would prefer not to be haunted, John. But he does give some great examples on how sometimes the anatomic models made in plastic or resin or acrylic or whatever are not the real thing. And a lot of my doctor friends really agree with this. They say that learning with an actual corpse and actual bones is very different than working with models and it's very instrumental in understanding how you're going to see the thing in real life. It is a very valid point, but the point that he is trying to make is cut short by how flippant and disrespectful he is with the culvert collection that he handles. Especially so, because he claims responsibility in a business that, while not illegal, is completely overrun with ethical and moral reasons that have to be solved before you can claim any sort of superiority in a business that is old as time and that a lot of people have been doing way more carefully and respectful than you. A responsible osteologist would not identify a collection of spines, of human spines, some of them belonging to children as their pride and joy. Each of those, those spines carried people who carried people and who cared for people. And they deserved way more than serve as a tacky decoration for a New York City apartment. And you may ask me, what about the existing specimens? What do we do with it? I don't know. This is a question my own university is trying to answer. My university, usually universities, when that corpse and that specimen is usually cannot be used anymore or is damaged beyond usability, they usually will cremate those remains, give them back to the family, or if that's impossible, properly bury them. The debate on private ownership of bones is one that I could spend like three or four videos talking only about this. And I tend to believe that private ownership of bones that are not belonging to immediate family members is completely unethical and should be outlawed. Of course, since in law and in medicine and um, in love, there is no always nor there is um, never, questions are a lot more complicated than that. And a lot of people have really, you know, difficult situations in which they my common possession of human remains. And so there are many questions that should be asked. And this is an important debate to be had. I'm not saying that we should never ever talk about people who have private, private ownership of bones and what that should be done with them. What I am saying, however, is that we can never lose sight of the fact that these are people who died and they deserve all the respect that we would give to any person within our immediate circle that died too. And so, to end this very long and drawn out conversation that is more word vomit than anything, I leave you with the prayer that my doctor friends recite whenever they are walking into anatomy class to deal with a corpse. While I press the hard blade of my scalpel over an unknown corpse, I remember that this body was born out of the love of two souls, was raised and lulled by the faith and hope of the one who in her bosom sheltered it, smiled and dreamed the same dreams as children and the young, for sure it loved and was loved and missed the ones who departed and cherished a happy tomorrow and now lies on the cold slate without a soul to spill a tear or say a single prayer on its behalf. Your name only God knows, but the inexorable fate gave you the power and greatness to serve the very humanity that passed you by indifferently. This was today's video and I hope that it gave you a lot to think and I will see you guys next time.